Live from San Francisco, California, it's The Cube at VMworld 2014, brought to you by VMware, Cisco, EMC, HP, and Nutanix. Now, here are your hosts, John Furrier and Dave Vellante. Hey, welcome back, and we're here live in San Francisco for VMworld 2014, this is theCUBE. I'm John Furrier with my co-host Dave Vellante. Our next guest is Andy Warfield, who's the CTO and co-founder of Coho Data. Uh, Andy, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you, it's great to be on. We'd love to have uh, tech experts and tech athletes, as we say. You've been around the block, and you were one of the office of Zen, which is the original hypervisor used on Amazon. Everyone knows kind of how that started, the beginning of this cloud revolution. So you're no stranger to technology innovation. Um, I got to get your take on where you think we are right now. I mean, obviously a huge change from the original cloud days to kind of how mainstream it is. What's your take of the state of the cloud meets enterprise, IT, data center, on-premise, off-premise? Reality, it's really exploding. Is it truly being rolled out across the board? Well, small question. <laughs> <laughs> I think, uh, I mean, there's, there's a lot of stuff going on right now. And uh, I, I think that nobody knows exactly how it's going to play out in a lot of regards, right? So, on the data center side, you've got these incredibly sophisticated environments, these massive scale environments. Um, they're quite a different creature than a lot of the stuff that you see even here with large scale VM and, and stuff like that. So I think you know, the, the hypervisor itself, um, to a large degree, has played itself out as an isolation layer. We're starting to see it climb up the food chain in terms of things like containerization for apps and stuff like that. I think really a lot of the excitement that's happening and is going to happen over the next like three or four years is going to be on the I.O. side of things. Network and storage. Yeah, so you're seeing obviously the revolution with software-defined networking. You know, the shot heard around the world a few years ago when this year was acquired by VMware. Martin's still here, he'll be on theCUBE. Um, virtualization certainly abstracted away a lot of complexities, but now you have um, this containerization. So we want to get on the containerization question first, which is, you know, break that down. I mean, where does it make sense? Certainly rest, rest, restful applications, stateless applications makes a lot of sense, but there's still a lot of state involved in the data center. Absolutely. So how, where, I mean, is it really going to thread through that? I mean, what, what's your take on in that area? It's pretty complicated. I think containerization is, is something that's going to, uh, the, First of all, containerization, I think even the containerized guys say, is, uh, is not a security technology, it's not an isolation technology, right? It's something that's really more around higher level APIs, packaging, right, and deployment. So you, the big successes that you see with it are with things like um, CoreOS style fleet management uh, deployments where you're, you're rolling out you know, hundreds or thousands of containerized applications and using it to do you know, upgrade, data migration, and stuff like that. Um, Less clear that at a single instance server, right? It's it's as um, immediately valuable in a cloud style virtualized environment. So the future of the hypervisor is, is SDX. Is that SDX? Software defined uh, everything. Yeah, software defined whatever. <laughs> uh, networking, storage, et, et cetera. Sure. Is that uh, how you I see it evolving? I, uh, or is that just or is that more narrow to a VMware? Where? sort of view, point of view. Well, how do you mean narrow to, uh, to VMware? Like the, the VMware is co-opting the software-defined term in terms of... Uh, They're attempting the to anyway. Right. right. <laughs> um, if you look at the way that, that software-defined kind of came around ahead of the virtualization people really taking it, right? If you look at uh, yeah, software-defined yeah. networking and before that software-defined radio, right? Which is, this, this term pre predates like loads and loads of stuff. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, it was really about kind of simplifying the hardware layer of systems and centralizing control over the software layer of systems, right? So software-defined radio was saying, you know, let's, let's do a lot of the frequency modulation and stuff for these, for these radio devices and software and make the devices themselves last a lot longer. Uh, software-defined networking kind of said, a lot of these uh, protocols, right, this protocol-driven development that we've done on things like BGP and spanning tree and ethernet and stuff like that, We've, we've taken this protocol-based approach and we built systems that kind of work at scale because they agree on some convergence properties. SDN kind of goes, you know, if you own the whole system, why don't you centralize that because it would be a lot simpler and you can simplify an operational task like provisioning. Right? So SDN to me kind of is realizing a value that virtualization had already realized for CPUs. Right? It's fast right. to provision a system, decouple hardware and software, right? easier to manage lifecycle. Um, I think that 
as we go forward, this, this aspect of SDN, right, and SDX, as you said, is going to be a big deal, right? That the decoupling the hardware from the software and really centralizing control is going to be something that takes advantage of convergence and lets us do some and, cool and stuff. And Coho is trying to take advantage of that, from, so, you, so software defined storage that leverages a, a, a SDN, is that yeah. the right way yeah. to look at it? Absolutely. So can you talk a little Absolutely. bit more about that? Well, so um, one of the things that we saw really early with Coho was this weird sort of similarity um, between the way that some of the first round um, PCIe, uh, this is the newest round of flash devices, uh, worked, right? So Flash has been around for 10 years. Flash people have been obsessed with durability problems on Flash, right? It's like the, you know, the, the, the thing that haunts Flash. Yeah. And, uh, it's created a whole industry. It's you created a whole industry. Deal with yeah. wear leveling. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> and the, the wear leveling stuff, to, uh, to a large degree, is, is, is pointless at this point, right? right? The, it's no you know, value the, <laughs> other than, hey, you don't lose your data. It's done, the card like, does it, and the, <laughs> yeah, the, right. the, the, the vendors sort it out. They warranty the card for 10 rewrites or five rewrites a day for five years, right? It's just like, forget it. Right. Um, the, uh, the thing that's really, you know, that struck us early on with, with the PCIe Flash in particular was that Flash is very quickly going in a direction where it looks like the CPU did 10 years ago. When we started working on Zen, when VMware started to, to really make sense in data centers, right, that CPU was an incredibly expensive resource. It was expensive to buy, and it was expensive to manage operationally. And the thing that you're about to see with Flash is it is so performance dense per cost that it's going to outweigh the CPU. Right, that, that Flash, this resource that's falling in price by half every year and a half to two years, that is still very expensive on a dollar per eye up basis relative to traditional storage, but is incredibly capable, is something that's really, really upsetting to how dollar we build meg, data centers. Right, you say it's very expensive on a dollar per meg, or you said dollar per I.O.? Both, oh, both okay. things, right? Uh, sorry, um, I cut you sorry, off. Sorry, 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 cheap on dollar per I.O. Yeah, but, yeah, uh, yeah, right, okay. But I.O. per gig, if you yes. want to think about it that way. Much higher, right? but, it's, uh, but it's, 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 it's strong forehand is dollar per I.O. Dollar per I.O., absolutely. Okay, yeah. so you see these trends, and you see the, so but, but, but carry that through. Help okay, so yeah, let me, let me follow through with it. So, so we have one card, right? We're originally, actually, we went out and presented to, uh, to Fusion IO. Um, Fusion gave us a few cards. Really the first gen, this is like 2010, fastest flash that, that you could buy. And we found that building, uh, well, we stuck it in a machine and we couldn't saturate the flash. Right? We couldn't reproduce Fusion's numbers on a single card. And it was because the software stack in Linux at the time um, was getting in the way, right? Just driving the thing at the block device layer was demanding enough that you couldn't saturate the flash. And so the realization that we had off of that was, you know, we did a bit of work on it. We found out that that device could saturate a 10 gig NIC. And so suddenly, the idea that you're going to build a storage system with 10 of those devices behind a CPU and a network, the way that we've always built storage, doesn't make sense. Right, that second card has no value to offer in terms of performance. And so, the really, really challenging thing with this flash is that it is so demanding and so difficult to drive at speed, right, to really expose the value from. Right? It looks a lot like the CPU did. And that's what kind of took us to the, to the SDN. Okay, so, you, so, you, so the world needs help in making yep. that resource more efficient and utilizing, uh, utilizing that asset better. Yep. So talk more about how you do that. What's sort of the secret sauce behind it? Sure, so I mean from a, I guess the way to think about what we, what we ended up doing is that we converge storage and the network. And so the OpenFlow guys have been doing all sorts of work on open standards and, and opening up what you can do with the switch. And from our perspective, they've created a bunch of really interesting APIs that irrespective of whether or not OpenFlow is deployed in an environment, whether you've done a full-scale you know, SDN-based network, suddenly you can program the switch. Suddenly all of this really cool merchant silicon that's been there for five years is available to be developed on. And so with the realization that this flash was so high performance that you were necessarily going to have to build network distributed storage systems, we incorporated the switches in Interconnect. And so by using the storage system to program the switch, we're able to do things like make a single IP address, right? A single apparent NFS server scale across hundreds of devices. Mm. Okay, so uh, that leads me to the next question about, you mentioned NFS. 
with Pat talking about VVOLs today. Yeah. So sort of what's the future uh, there? What do, you, what do you, first of all, what do you make of VVOLs? Obviously it's a, it's a good thing, so we have a- It's been a long time coming. You know, right, I mean, <laughs> it's, and, and it's still, still not, not here. Still not clear it's here. <laughs> right. It's, uh, um, but so how should the world be thinking about VVOLs? Is that going to be the standard mode of operation you know, going forward? I guess, I guess yes, it's kind of obvious, but it's hard to get there. I and mean, what happens to NFS? I think we'll see what happens. I mean, with, with VVOLs as an NFS provider, right? For, so VMware specifically, obviously there's a huge amount of value available to us uh, serving NFS to VMware, right? We get a lot of visibility into the, the VMs that are running on top of us, into their data, and so on and so forth. Whereas running VMFS on top of an iSCSI line or a fiber channel line, you don't have any of that visibility. VVOLs initially is a response to that, right? It's trying to put the block-based storage providers back in the game that the, 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 would, the so NAS guys kind of yeah, yeah. You know, got up front. <laughs> um, a lot of the parallelism and scale of access we were already getting with the SDN switch. And so there are opportunities for us to win off of VVOLs to, to make the product better, but we've actually managed to get a lot of that value without it. So okay, so, so do VVOLs level the playing field or do they, do they allow uh, uh, the guys who can expose all those, those functions uh, 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 in a VVOL world uh, at a VM granularity level, does it make them stronger? I mean, what do you think? I, I think the traditional array vendors have been trying to catch up with what you can do with the virtualization layer for a long time, <laughs> and this is another way for them to get a little bit more caught up, but they're still... <laughs> yeah, they're, well, they're they, still well the big question is, will they catch up or will they yeah. fall further behind, right? I mean, it's, yeah. it seems to be getting harder and harder and harder yeah. for those guys. Yeah. Well, so I the mean, question I want to ask you is, we're going to have Martin Casada on, what should we ask him? What's Jess Martin? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is like me throwing rocks that, that he can't throw back until the, uh, yeah. until the end of the show. Yeah. The secret planted question. Martin's yeah. a good friend. I see him around town at, uh, at the stores and stuff. But he's, he's technical, but he, he's very vocal. But you know, he's also on the case. He's very in, involved in the, the community. So what would you ask him if you, you were Sure, I, I, I know Martin, a super fun guy. We were doing PhD at the same time. So we, we know each other from Zen and, and, and earlier stuff like that. Um, I guess I'd, I was, I was, I remember Martin talking last year on this actually. He was talking about, uh, about how he thought that virtualizing the network was really going to be the way into virtualizing a lot of the rest of the data center, right? That, in fact, I think he said that really storage was a natural, easy thing after networking, right? Okay. My take on this is that, uh, you know, unlike compute and the network, storage is the thing where if you screw it up, right, you're, you're screwed. Permanently <laughs> in trouble. Yeah, plain and, trouble. Uh, well, we had, we had, the consequences are financial penalties and also catastrophic. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, not to uh, mention absolutely. you're fired. Not to, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I guess um, I would be really interested to know how, um, especially from VMware's perspective, because Martin's doing some really, really exciting stuff with, with the direction that NSX is going, how those are going to open up new opportunities for the people that are building storage systems, right, and for storage to work. We're getting an enormous amount of value off of the switch, but none of that value is actually exposed you know, through things like NSX as an endpoint based network virtualization technology. So, as a simple example, I can saturate a 10 gig NIC, right? I'd like to plumb seven 10 gig paths across a data center, right? I'd like the tools to, to ask for that topology and to plumb that path. And NSX, as it's currently conceived, doesn't let you do things like that. Yeah, so, and that's a DevOps philosophy. Right. When you think about what you just said, that's basically auto provisioning, auto configuration. It's pretty complicated, it's not easy. No. Um, and it's not just virtual, it's physical as well, right? Yeah. It's, it's both <laughs> things. Yeah, mind boggling. So I got to ask you the PhD question, given you, you know, you in the academic world, what's, what's getting you, well, we're in the academic world, uh, now running a company, a CTO, and co-founder, what is the, the hot things that you're excited about in academics that's translating quickly into, into business um, and entrepreneurship, where there's a lot of entrepreneurs out there really smart who want to do more than the Y Combinator app. They want to really do some heavy duty science and, and engineering around the DevOps. Sure, sure, that's a great question. Um, I, I think one of the biggest things on this side um, is the realization that, um, especially for large scale compute data processing applications, you need to move that as close as you can to the, uh, to the, to the data. Yeah. And, and we, we don't have the APIs for that today. Right, it's not NFS. It's not sticking your stuff in Hadoop inside a VM with 15 layers of indirection in between it. And so, you know, it's, it's how do you build scalable, interesting, you know, efficient computing systems 
that, that aren't so pie in the sky that they don't work with anything that we've built today. Right? It's an interoperability question. Which yeah. The Docker's a nice roadmap, starting point for that Docker's that spectacular concept. for this. So Absolutely. we brought up stateful applications versus stateless applications. Um, so it's a little bit complicated, but we've got some questions in the crowd. Tim Crawford, our favorite. Tim, good to see you out there. Uh, Tim Crawford asks, uh, does VMware really need to venture into hardware? EVO, colon, rail, question mark. Or is that heading in the wrong direction? Will it be a distraction? What's your take on that question? I don't know, the, I mean, I guess the, the broader bit around this is really the hyper-converged thing, right? Like, you know, VMware is under pressure from, I guess, uh, hardware appliance vendors that at the end of the day could replace the hypervisor with a different hypervisor in their offering. And so EVO ends up as, as the sort of counterpoint to that as a packaged software offering. I think that hyper-converged itself is a, is a pretty uh, naive way initially of thinking about things insofar as a lot of these offerings seem to really, really want to chase a fixed ratio of compute, networking, and storage. And no one has that workload. Yeah, it's all dynamic. Yeah, it's super dynamic. And you know, we go, no two customers are the same on this side from, from our perspective. And so being able to scale all three of those things and have different lifetimes for those yeah. three components in the data center is super important. Yeah, diversity of workload, you got different application architectures. Yep. That, so that's another dimension, right? Yeah. So like, and just to clarify for Tim's question, I mean, he, he, uh, VMware would say, well look, we're, ena we're enabling the ecosystem to do that, we're not getting into the hardware business. Right? You know, VMware is still a software company. Right. So. right. Andy Warfield. Okay, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead, continue. <laughs> no, no, well, no, that's it. Um, uh, unless uh, they start running EMC, uh, never so, mind. So <laughs> let me make one last point on that thing. The, the, the one thing that I think is absolutely true of all of these sort of EVO or hyper-converged appliances is that they are absolutely responding to an operational simplicity need. And yeah. that that might be the thing that is, that is really worth thinking about as you look at scaling the data center. But it's not storage or hyper-converged, it's not like you know, managed network or like you know, virtualized software-based network. It is simplicity at the end of the day. And a lot of the, uh, the especially newer you know, vendors that are coming into both storage and networking are actually putting an enormous amount of effort into that simplicity. Right? Mm -hmm. and, well, and that's so, the abstraction issue. You want to abstract away the complexities to get the simplicity. Yeah. That's the end game. Andy, great to have you on theCUBE. Really appreciate you coming on as our guest um, to break get down some of, the, some of the trends. Always great to have folks, uh, CTO, co-founders, both technical experts and entrepreneurs. Congratulations on Code Data, and uh, we'll be watching you guys. This is theCUBE live here in VMworld San Francisco. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante. We'll be right back after this short break. <laughs>